Welcome to a new installment of Look and Listen, our monthly online exploration of the intersections between Asian art and music. I'm Emma Stein, Assistant Curator of South and Southeast Asian Art here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. And I'm joined today from Cambodia by Sophie Lien Chiam Shapiro, a master dancer and choreographer in Cambodian classical and contemporary dance. You've just been enjoying a dance called Mkar, which traditionally concludes the Buang Swang ritual prayer for rain and therefore fertility. 
Ankar features 14 dancers that together form the serpent deity called Anyak or Naga, with their fans representing its scales. This recording of Ankar was made specially for this program by the Sophie Arts Ensemble, the classical dance company in Phnom Penh, founded and directed by Sophie Lean Chem Shapiro. She is a winner of the National Heritage Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, America's highest honor in the traditional arts. She has both studied and taught at Cambodia's School of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh, and is also a graduate of UCLA's World Arts and Cultures program. Her groundbreaking original choreography has expanded the possibilities of her dance form to address modern themes. Her many original dances have been performed around the world. She graced us with an original performance at the Freer and Sackler in 2019. Many of our other Look and Listen programs have focused on specific musical instruments or vocal traditions. In Southeast Asia, multiple performing arts genres are often interwoven in highly theatrical styles, where dance is joined with vocal and instrumental music, as well as costume, scenery, and props to create powerful links among them all, and especially between sculpture and dance. Together, Sophie Lean and I will explore a recurrent theme that appears in the Cambodian arts and also in South and Southeast Asian art much more broadly, the Naga, the serpent deity that serves as a bridge between earthly and divine worlds. The Naga has a special importance in Cambodia. As part of the local creation myth, the Naga plays a key role in the Khmer people's sense of identity and culture. It also appears repeatedly in sacred architecture particularly on bridges and temple roofs. Sophie Lean will talk about the Naga from her perspective as a dancer and choreographer. And then through the program, we'll unfurl how the Naga has inspired everything from divine images to bodily adornments to ritual objects and musical instruments. Sophie Lean, the floor is yours. Thanks, Emma. On the east side of the Uncle Ward, there is a bar of leaves called the turning of the sea of milk. In this carving, there is a group of gods and a group of demons come together to pull at the opposite end of a, of a serpent named Vasuki. And they want to turn the sea of milk so that they would get the ambrosia of immortality. The turning of the sea of milk is also give birth to Apsaras, a heavenly spirit. And one of the Apsara named Mera married to a, an Indian hermit named Kampu. Kampu and Mera become Kamera, become Kamra and Khmai. Nowadays, we call ourselves Junjit Khmai. Another creation myth is called Pretau Menir. It's a, it tells the union between an Indian prince and a Naga princess, who is considered as a, the earliest ancestor of the Khmer people. In this story, Pretau holds the tales of Menir on their journey to meet her parent in the Naga kingdom. Nowadays, we could find this scene is reenacted in contemporary Cambodian wedding, but when you see the, the groom carry the end of the sash of the bride, and they walk in circle in front of the parents. You could find many images of Naga all over Cambodia. You could find it on uh, temple architectures, um, and everyday objects that used by the royal court or by farmers. Um, but one of the most prominent uh, use of Naga is the railings on staircases that lead to the temple sanctuary over here, um, which symbolize the connection or the bridge between earth and heaven. Thank you, Sophie Lin. So we've learned about the Naga's importance in Khmer creation myths and origin stories. It's a sacred symbol and one that appears time and time again on the temples of the Angkor Empire, 
which were built between the 9th and 13th centuries. Let's look now at how the Naga, in this case a king cobra, is depicted on some specific temples, rearing its multiple heads, its belly down and fangs exposed. Here it is at the world famous monument of Angkor Wat, the Naga is most typically positioned at the end of a balustrade that flanks great causeways or bridges leading to the temples. Here's the massive bridge leading into the central city of Angkor Thom. The bridge leads across a wide moat to the city gate. It was built in the 12th century by the emperor Jayavarman VII, who expanded the Khmer kingdom to its greatest extent. You can see that the Naga appears on both sides of the bridge, its body forms the banisters, and it's held by gods on the left side, which you see here in the picture, and demons on the right side. This represents the origin myth and the churning of the ocean of milk. The Naga acquired the status of a royal emblem in the Khmer Kingdom. On the northern border of the empire, today in a contested site between Thailand and Cambodia, stands the massive temple complex of Preovihir. A staircase leading down to the Thai plains is marked by a monumental, imposing yet sensuous figure of a Naga. Back in central Angkor and at any of the Khmer temples, once you begin to see Nagas, you find them everywhere, on banisters, corners, over doors, along roofs. In sacred architecture, the serpent prevails over all. Sophie Lin, does the Naga insert it self in the same way into dance? Definitely. I can demonstrate to you here. Cambodian dance uh, body postures and gestural vocabulary mimic the S shapes of the Naga. For example, here, when I put my hand up in the sky, facing up the sky, that is uh, the head of the uh, of the serpent, and here the tail of the serpent. Um, there is a movement, uh, a gesture called "nip leng kon toy," which means the serpent play with its own tail by doing this. This is "nip leng kon toy." So here's the head of the serpent, and this is the kon toy, or the the near tail curls up. The body posture is also reflects that S shape as well. So you can see that from the head to the neck to the slightly arched back and the bend of the knees and the turn up of the toes. So dancers keep their toes up at all time. Even when they turn, So you keep your, your toes up and your finger bend backward um, to reflect this curve. And here the posture, you can see um, the hand make a circle uh, that bring energy from the chest, from the sternum, through the hand to the tip of the finger and back to the corner of your eye. So you could see the circle and the energy running in and out of the body. And uh, this is as well, you could see that circle of energy connected with this circle with this, the energy that come out of my right hand as well. Um, uh, the movement, the flow of the movement reflects these S shapes too. So let's say here, This is a movement sometimes used when a character is transforming from one character to another, from one form to another. So, and particularly for a female character, you switch and move your arm up and down, left and right in that S shapes. The body and the movement of the dancer reflects the, the sacredness of the um, of the serpent. For example, here, this is like stui dai tom, which means that uh, if you look at 
um, the position itself, that the half of the body is rooted to the ground and the upper half of the body is lift up in the space above and the energy run from the toes to the tip of the headdress of the top of the head or the headdress to heaven. And this is the significance of the dance in the ways that the dance is being able uh, or symbolize the connection between earth and heaven. And this connection allow the dancer to play a sacred role in ritual. So kings and governor and uh, commune chiefs organize or arrange the Wong uh, Sung ceremony, which means the prayer ceremony for rain, for peace, for health, for good health, for prosperity. And in this Wusu ceremony, they have dance and music and offering of fruits and food and flowers and other uh, uh, um, ritual elements to offer to their ancestor, to the deity, and to the gods. And this is because of that that uh, uh, embodiment of the serpent as the spirit of the land, as the spirit of the of the king, uh, yeah, of, of the land, and uh, and therefore the dancer can connect these, can send or can bring the the uh, uh, request from the people for prosperity to the deity, and then can also bring blessing from the deity of prosperity. To the, to the people. And that is the sacred, uh, medium, uh, uh, significant of dancers. Emma, can you tell me if this serpent aesthetic is also being incorporated into the ancient sculpture? Thank you, Sophie Lin. It is. We've heard about the Naga's undulating body as a central principle in Cambodian dance. Now, how does that play out in sculpture? Let's look first at this powerful figure of Uma, the Hindu goddess. Notice her straight posture, her column-like form. She doesn't bend or arch nearly at all. Her chest is bare, as was customary for women in Cambodia during the time of the Angkor Empire. And she wears a straight sampot or sarong, a kind of skirt that is wrapped around her waist and falls down in a straight shaft to her ankles. Look how the artist has found space for intricate design work on the sampot and also on the tiara-shaped crown on top of her head. When Sophie Lin and her dancers came to the National Museum of Asian Art for a performance in 2019, one of the dancers remarked that they tie their headdresses just like Uma's here. As a major goddess in Hindu tradition, this Uma would have been installed in the central shrine of a Cambodian temple sometime in the 10th century. She would have stood on a pedestal high in a tower, looking out across the city of Angkor with its moats, temples, settlements, and lush tropical landscape. In Hindu philosophy, mountains are sacred. So artists created temple mountains designed to mirror the shape of the cosmic mountain, Meru, that is said to stand at the center of the universe. The divine images were like pillars with straight spines and weight equally distributed on two feet. But they found spaces for intricate dynamic designs on temple walls and surfaces. Let's look now at this architectural element, a lintel that once graced the upper rim of a doorway to a temple. It was also created in the 10th century. Like other Cambodian sculpture and architecture, it was made of local sandstone, a workable type of stone that lends itself readily to detailed carving. Look at the form that undulates its way across the entire surface, curving up and down in a dynamic arch. This is a multivalent symbol. It's a vine, but it's also a serpent. Cambodian temples are filled with this kind of semi-abstract imagery but there are also more explicit depictions of Nagas, which we'll look at next. But first, let's hear about the dancers' attire and how they prepare for performance. Over to you, Sophie Lin. 
Thanks. The serpent aesthetic also embody in Cambodian dance costume. For example, here's the kabang, which is a very small headdress for female character. You could see that this is a shape uh, of a serpent right in the center. And this one is a headdress for a female character uh, or serpent character as well. Uh, which later I will uh, uh, show. Uh, here the sash, uh, that female character uh, in classical dance wear. And uh, so you can see this symbolize the, the Naga's tail. And the pattern is symbolize the scale of the Naga. Prop is also the, uh, the prop that the dancer use. Uh, for example, here's the, the bow, uh, um, which is also shaped into the Naga's uh, 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 form as well. So the dancer can hold like this, like that, or sometimes they hold like this as a way to uh, use this as a, as a weapon. Emma, can you um, uh, elaborate on these uh, Naga aesthetics in, that's uh, being used in other um, body ornamentations in South and Southeast Asia as well? Certainly. We've now seen how important the Naga is as a symbol in classical Khmer dance vocabulary and in the costumes. As such an auspicious and protective symbol, the Naga also appears in jewelry and ornaments, particularly for kings, gods, and dancers. In the royal Thai court, the Naga is a symbol reserved for the king. This gold ring was made in the 19th century and belonged to a ruler. The ring is shaped like a coiled serpent that would wrap around the king's finger. The artisan purposefully left the tongue loose. So as the king moved his hand, the gold would catch the light and the serpent's tongue would flick in and out as if it were alive. The king would appear as a majestic and even magical being. In South Asia, the Naga often appears on temple sculpture as a protective symbol for the gods. Here, in this powerful figure of the elephant-headed deity Ganesha, the Naga coils around his waist as an ornament. It protects him, and it also shows his potential to protect the devotee. It is particularly important for Ganesha's midsection to be protected because there is a tradition that he holds the seeds of the universe in his belly. The Naga also appears as an ornament in this South Indian oil lamp. The lamp belongs to a pair of honorific portrait sculptures, one male, one female, to commemorate a gift to a Tamil temple. The female figure wears an ornament covering her braid, at the top of which is a rearing cobra with a coiled tail. The braid ornament itself is also associated with the Naga. In Indian poetry, the swaying motion of the beloved's braid is often likened to a snake. At the top of the braid cover is an image of the Hindu god Krishna dancing on a multi-headed naga that he has tamed. Thanks, Emma, for sharing uh, uh, your understanding and helping us to understand the concept uh, of the naga in the larger context. Now, I would like to bring your attention to the uh, aesthetic of the naga in Cambodian music which accompany the dance. So uh, this music is called um, Bun Beat Ensemble, which compose of xylophone, can be both uh, bamboo or metal xylophone, a, uh, we call it Ramit, or Ramit Ait and Ramit Pong, and uh, a circle gong, which is gong bung tot and gong bung thong. Uh, drums, the sampo and the score tone, 
and uh, there's the hand symbol as uh, called chang, and uh, also that uh, and these the sound that these instruments make is uh, is very very da 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 da. So it 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 sounds very staccato uh, 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 kind of, of sound, and so these represents the scale of the serpent. The ensemble, all this sound, is connected by the oboe, which is a quadruple uh, reed uh, uh, oboe called Sarai. To play this an, an instrument, the player, the musician, have to use um, a circular breathing type of technique to execute, to produce the sound. And this sound have the uh, flowing qualities which resemble the energies and the body of the serpent that connect all the dot, all the nong 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 sound together as an ensemble. In the dance tradition, uh, every Thursday, we uh, students offer five pieces of incense and two pieces of Hand, uh, a candle to their teacher to show their gratitude. And in return, the teacher blessed the students with great mind, sharp minds, and la long lasting memory. Other time, we arrange a, a longer, uh, a bigger uh, ceremony called Sampeh Kru. And in this ceremony, uh, besides the rituals, offering of flower, fruit, and food, uh, we have dance and music. So at the at the, uh, closer to the end of the ritual, all the participants, which are teachers and students, sit in circle around the altar. In the middle is the priest, and the priest will put candle on top of a of a stick that in in the shape of a serpent's head or in the shape of a banyan leaves. And um, so um, the candle is there and so the priest will pass that candle to all the participants and each of them receive the candle and they, they, they move their hand in circular blowing the uh, smoke toward the, the uh, altar for as a blessing for fertility and pass it on to the next person. Um, and the same thing over and uh, uh, everyone's doing the same motion. So circular and move on and circular and move on. So this is kind of like a, a, like a, a serpent moving one's step to the next slowly like that. And in this moment, the ensemble play a melody called Nien Nien, which is reflecting that sense of, of circle but moving forward. Now let's hear uh, Nien Nien's melody uh, for the accompaniment of this ritual.
Thanks for making the significance of the music for Cambodian dance so clear. We've now seen how the Naga makes its way into architecture, the dancer's body, musical instruments, and the very structure of music. Throughout Southeast Asian art and South Asian art, Nagas also feature in objects that are used in temple rituals. Here, in this beautiful oil lamp from East Java, Indonesia, we see an explicit depiction of the Naga. Its tail arches up to form the handle, hung from a chain with a hook, and its head supports the dish that would be filled with oil and burned to illuminate the dark chamber of a shrine or cave temple. In East Javanese art, the Naga looks almost like a Chinese dragon, but without feet. This bump that you see on the top of the Naga's head represents a jewel. As guardians of the watery netherworld, Nagas are said to protect the coral reefs and to dwell in jeweled palaces. As signs of their regal status, they carry jewels on top of their heads. We see the association between the Naga and water in this vessel, which is also from East Java, Indonesia. It's shaped like a Naga, with the tail forming the handle and the head the spout. There's a hole inside, allowing water to flow out through the Naga's mouth. As the water emerges, it's symbolically blessed by the Naga and becomes holy. The vessel itself is shaped like a lotus flower, a symbol of purity and perfection throughout Buddhist and Hindu art. Although we see these objects today in the silent galleries of a museum, they would have been used together with sound. In South India, the Naga even finds its way into the symbolism of the musical instruments that accompany every Hindu ritual, just like in Cambodia. The Nagashwaram is a double reed instrument that takes its name from the Tamil and Sanskrit words Naga, serpent, plus sound, chodam or svadam. Sophieline, now the floor is yours for our final section. To conclude our program, I would like to show you a short clip of a rehearsal of my uh, solo piece called Ningmit Devi. Ningmit Devi is a piece that I would like to demonstrate or to apply the themes of Naga into my contemporary uh, dance uh, work. <clears throat> in 2005, I created a production called Seasonal Migrations, which addressed the themes of culture shock, which also addressed the experience, my own experience, of uh, being immigrant, an immigrant to the United States. Culture shock has four stages, uh, euphoria, rejection, adjustment, and equilibrium. In each stage, force and allow an individual to transform, to go through different transformations of identity. Nimit Devi uh, focus on the second stage of culture shock, which is the subject of uh, identity crisis. So Nimit realized that she has a long tail and she didn't like it and therefore she wanted to tear it off and, uh, but it hurts. And finally, she learned to accept her tales as part of her identity and as part of her cultural uh, pride. In Ninit Devi, uh, I modify or uh, uh, I choose two things that to, to work on. One is I look at the Makar dance that we saw at the beginning of the programs. The Makar dance is performed by 14 dancers. Dancer shapes up into the serpent uh, shapes and move in the circular and S shapes. So this is a group dance. So for me to create Nyanmit Devi, I want it to be a solo piece. So how can I create a, a, a look and a feel of serpent by one dancer? So I look into, uh, I look into uh, um, the headdress that you see here. Uh, this is a headdress that modeling from a headdress uh, that was one worn by King Norodom in the 19th century. In that headdress, they uh, the, the serpent's head was placed right on top, but it was a male serpent. Uh, 
So Ninmit Devi is a female serpent. And so I later on create this uh, uh, to have it a little bit more feminine look. Uh, also, I modify uh, uh, one more element, which is the sash. As you see, this sash is about a meter, mm, a meter and 20 centimeter, uh, 30 centimeter. And so uh, for Nimit uh, sash, I double the length uh, so that she can, as she travels, the sash follow her, glide behind her, and as she moves, she turn around, the sash is long enough to curl around her feet, make her difficult to move. So it become more dramatic. So this is my way of uh, trying to, to uh, create this feeling of, uh, of serpent uh, uh, or transforming a dancer into a serpent.
Thank you, Sophie Lean. That was beautiful. And thank you all for coming to our Look and Listen program. We've learned about the importance of the Naga, the serpent or King Cobra in Cambodian identity, architecture and performing arts. And we've seen its wider importance throughout South and Southeast Asia. I hope you've enjoyed this serpentine journey and that you will look for the Naga the next time you visit the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art or explore our collections online. I'm Emma Stein signing off and wishing you health and happiness until our next program. Thank you.